There have been 19,929 people who have played Major League Baseball. Some of them were religious, some of them were musical, but only one of them was a violin-playing Catholic priest. The year is 1912, and this is Shy Park, home of the Philadelphia Athletics. At this time, the Athletics are a very good baseball team. They're so good that they won the 1910 World Series, and then the 1911 World Series, and they go on to win the 1913 World Series, but remember, this is only 1912, and coming into their May 18 game, they actually have a losing record. They shouldn't be too worried about the slow start. Since Shy Park opened in 1909, they have a home winning percentage just under 700 better than any other team over that span. Their opponent in this game is the Detroit Tigers. The Tigers haven't won any World Series yet, but they're far from a bad team. They've had five consecutive winning seasons, three World Series losses, and they have some good players. Among those players is Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb is known as being one of the best hitters in MLB history. In fact, his career batting average of 366 is the best all time. And he's also known as being not a great person. Stories of violence and racism may have been embellished, but whether or not all the stories are true, we know that on May 15, 1912, Cobb jumped into the stands and, well, let's just read this article. The Detroits beat the Highlanders yesterday and Ty Cobb beat a spectator. The score of the regular mill was 8-4, to four, but though there was no official decision in the Cobb vs. Spectator fight, the unanimous verdict was that Cobb won. There couldn't have been any other decision. Cobb did all the punching. Yeah, so basically in response to some heckling, Cobb jumped to the stands and started beating up Claude Luker, who in an industrial accident had lost one hand and only had three fingers on his other hand. Other fans yelled at Cobb to stop hitting a man with no hands, and Cobb responded, I don't care if he has no feet. It just so happened that American League President Ben Johnson was in attendance to witness this with his own eyes. He suspended Cobb, which led to his Tiger teammates refusing to play until he was reinstated. Johnson then threatened to fine the Tigers $5,000 for every game they failed to field a team, resulting in a search for replacement players. Okay, so if you aren't interested yet, this is where it gets really interesting. And there's a few variations of this story, but ultimately it's May 18 and the Tigers are now in Philadelphia. They're a few hours away from game time and they don't have any players, so they get in touch with a local 20-year-old and ask him to round up as many fellows as he could find to play for the Tigers that day. So he goes to a nearby corner where a bunch of fellows were standing around and he's like, hey, do you guys play baseball? And they're like, no, not really. Well, we'll make a few bucks if we just play this one baseball game. And they're like, yeah, that works. Clearly, I don't know the dialogue and I don't know if these guys were told about those World Series championships or that 700 winning percentage, but that bunch of fellows became the Tigers for a day. And oh yeah, that 20 year old. This is Reverend Aloysius Allen Stanislaus Travers. Now, he's not a Catholic priest at the time, but he goes on to be one. Here he's a 20 year old college student who plays violin and is the manager of the baseball team at St. Joseph's College. Up to this point, he's never pitched a baseball game in his life. But for some cash and a chance to get your name in the history books, he took the mound. So they start the game with Allen throwing to the Mighty Athletics lineup with Hall of Famers Eddie Collins and home run Baker. He's throwing slow curves because the A's weren't used to them, and because manager Huey Jennings told him not to throw any fastballs as he was afraid Allen might get killed. Well, he doesn't get killed, and aside from giving up a few runs, it really doesn't go that badly at first. I mean, the Tigers' fill-in players can't get any hits, but in terms of the scoreboard, this is far from an embarrassment halfway through the game. As you can see, the Tigers actually did score two runs, thanks to some former players, now coaches, who got a couple hits. I don't think the Tigers were starting to think they could win this, but at this point there's nothing to hang your head about. And, and the A's put up 18 runs over the next four innings, and we have a final score of 24-2. Not great, but what did you expect? Looking at the box score, we see that the Tigers really had nothing positive on offense. Aside from Ed Irwin, who had two triples in his three at-bats, unlike some of his teammates, he actually had some previous baseball experience. The rest of their hits came from the quadragenarian coaches who played in this game to fill in the gaps. 
and as evidenced by the score, the A's really did beat up on Travers, hitting six triples and four doubles, and taking advantage on the base paths with 10 stolen bases. Five of those were by Eddie Collins, who eventually edged out eighth all-time in steals. Since 1900, the 26 hits and 24 runs allowed by Travers are still the most given up by a single pitcher in one game. But only 14 of the runs were earned because, remember, he had a team of non-baseball players backing him up, and those guys made seven errors. I want to point out that, yes, seven errors in a game is bad, but the actual Tigers made six errors five days earlier, and they already had a seven-error game on May 1st. Bad, but not unheard of. Since only 14 runs were earned, Allen's career earned run average is 15.75, which to clarify for anyone unclear means that he gives up 15.75 runs every 9 innings. That's much higher than the 3.37 average ERA in 1912, and even as that average continues to rise, at this pace it's going to take another 1,000 years or so for 15 runs a game to be normal. But 15.75 is far from the worst ERA of all time. Uh, there's a term we need to look at here, and that is a cup of coffee. To have a cup of coffee technically means a brief trial in the major leagues by a player. Figuratively speaking, it's barely long enough for them to drink a cup of coffee. Here we have the most recent 600 instances of a player who had exactly one cup of coffee, or in terms of baseball stats, played exactly one baseball game. Some pitched one game, some batted in the game, some pinch ran, but they all have had exactly one cup of coffee. Down near the bottom, we have our eight Tigers players. Having even two players doing the same game is rare, and 1952 was the most recent time that happened. While we're here, I want to point out there are all kinds of fun tidbits throughout this list, and it would be unfair to not look at a few of them. Here's 3 foot 9 Eddie Goodell, whose small strike zone was used by Bill Veck to draw a walk on four pitches. Veck was told he was making a mockery of the game, and Goodell's contract was voided the next day. In 1963, John Patrick, whose brother played 18 years in MLB, had three hits and three at bats, two walks, and three runs batted in. Injuries cut his career short, and he finished with a perfect 1,000 batting average. And maybe the opposite of that, Hall of Famer Robin Yount's brother Larry holds the unique distinction of being the only pitcher in Major League history to appear in the official record books without ever actually facing a batter. That's right, in his only Major League appearance, he got injured during his warm-up pitches and had to leave the game. Now, one-game stints happened a lot more frequently in the early 1900s, but since 2000, there's been 74. And during that span, there's been 16 pitchers who have a higher career ERA than Allen. Some ERAs in the 20s and 30s, and even the 67.5 in 2010. And of course, there are even pitchers who recorded zero outs in their career, but gave up runs, resulting in an infinite ERA. Since Travers, there have been 86 pitchers on this list who have had a worse ERA, including 12 infinite ERAs. Plus, he didn't even have the worst in the 1912 season. No need to worry, he did in fact set a negative record for game score. So what is game score? It's not the 24-2 score of the game, it has to do with quickly assessing a pitcher's performance in a single game by looking at one easy to understand number. You start with 50 points and you add points for outs recorded, innings completed after the fourth, and strikeouts. Then you subtract points for hits, runs, earned runs, and walks. Game score correlates strongly with winning percentage, so that a pitcher with an average game score of 60 can be expected to win approximately 60% of the time. The average game score is 50. The highest game score belongs to Kerry Wood. In May 1998, Wood, who like Travers was only 20 years old, pitched a one-hit, complete game shutout, striking out 20 of the 29 batters he faced. If we do the quick math on Wood's game, we see he finished with a score of... 105. Now that we know the average 50 and the all-time high of 105, let's just see how low Allen can go. Negative 54. Officially the worst game score 
in Major League Baseball history. There's a good chance this record will never be broken, and there's a good chance we'll never see non-baseball players taken off the street to play an official game again. But I'm so glad it happened. A bunch of fellows became the Tigers for one day. Most of them went on with their lives and don't have much written about them as far as I could find. Billy Mayharg is the only one who got a second chance at playing baseball and then had his hand in the 1919 Black Sox scandal. Bill Leinhauser ended up as captain of the Philadelphia Police Department. Vince Manny wrote to his brother saying he played shortstop and had more fun than you can imagine. And our beloved Alan taught Spanish and religion, was dean of men in his alma mater, and became a priest in 1926, officially making him the only Catholic priest to play Major League Baseball.